So here's Professor Cusco. All right. Um, all right, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> I would like to thank everyone for being here on a cold and dark winter night. Um, I'm sincerely honored to have been invited by Tom Johnson to give a lecture in this jewel of a house and a library that he owns. However, by asking me to discuss Judaism, past and present, in 45 minutes, <laughs> Tom Johnson has presented me with the same kind of challenge that a certain heathen in the Talmud, a classic Jewish text from the late antiquity, threw at the two most famous rabbis of first century Palestine. He told them that he would become a proselyte, he would convert to Judaism, if they could teach him the entire Torah while standing on one foot. <laughs> now, I could do like Shammai, the first rabbi that the Hittim went to, and chase you away with a measuring rod for making such an impertinent proposal. Or I could do like Hillel, the second rabbi, um, did, and just tell you that the whole content of Torah can be summed up into one principle. What is hateful to you, do not do unto your neighbor. But then urge you to go out and learn the rest, which is commentary. <laughs> but both of these options would end our evening in a rather odd and abrupt way, I suspect. Moreover, I am not a rabbi, but a historian of Jewish thought. So I will have to take a different approach to the topic at hand. This is to say that while I cannot tell you what Judaism is, I can try to sketch some of the forms that Judaism has taken in various geographical areas and at different times in history, including here in the Ozarks in the last 200 years. Now, let us begin with a question. Who are the Jews? Are they a religious community based on shared beliefs and rituals? Or are they perhaps an ethnic group? Or are Jews a nation which, uh, by definition, shares a history, a language, and a homeland? As you can probably imagine, each of the above ways of defining Jews has its own limitations. If we define Jews as a religious community, then what about secular Jews? And um, we also have to ask the question, have all Jewish beliefs and rituals historically been shared by all Jews? <laughs> now, if we define Jews as an ethnic group, on the other hand, um, what do they share other than blood? And what is the status of converts to Judaism? And what's more, can a Jew do anything that is non-Jewish? Or, by contrastingly, by contrast, can a non-Jew do anything Jewish? Now, if Jews are a nation, which language is history, and history is really common to all? Which ones can we leave out? Um, and again, if Jews are a nation, well, can there be a landless nation, because that has been historically the case for many, many years. So, it seems appropriate to say that then, within Judaism, there is both diversity, Jews have lived in different times and places in contact with different cultures and religious traditions over the centuries, as well as uniformity. This uni uniformity factor, most scholars argue, is based on three elements. The first element is Israel, where by Israel we mean the Jewish people. The second element is God understood as one and only creator of the universe who chose Israel, a particular people, to make a covenant with them and, uh, to, and reveal them Torah as uh, the content of that covenant. And the third element you see is Torah, which is in fact understood to be the content of God's revelation to the people of Israel, etc., etc., etc. Now, if this is correct, in order to talk about Judaism in the past, 
we have to begin at the point when these three elements, Israel, God, and Torah, were first put together. Now, as it happens, the first mention of Israel as a people, the first time we see the word Israel to indicate a people that dwelled in what we call today Syro-Palestine, geographically speaking, appears um, on the so-called Merneptah Stele, which is an Egyptian inscription uh, that we can date to the late 13th century BCE. Mm. We're talking about uh, rough, roughly 3300, 32, 3300 years ago. Um, now, what that inscription proves is that at that one point in time in the land that the Bible calls Canaan there were uh, some sort of uh, independent people that other people, neighbors, recognized as Israel, as their little own thing. Um, however, we know very little about their the, the possibly the culture and the religion of these people, of this original or early Israel. Uh, what scholars believe is that at least before the 7th century BCE, uh, what, we can call, what we can talk about is not really Judaism, but something that, again, scholars call an Israelite Judean religion that was based on monolatry, the belief that while uh, other people may have other gods, the people of Israel had their own god who was in charge of the people of Israel and the land of Israel. And they called that god uh, Yahweh, or uh, with the four letter, letter name that we see in the Bible. Um, we know that those people tended to um, mainly worship through sacrifices and through pilgrimages at multiple shrines, not at one central temple. And that uh, an important um, element of that religion and culture was the figure of the prophet. Now, the same scholars who talk about the Israel and Judean religion also see the emergence of the second element of uh, those three that we mentioned, um, Torah, not before the 7th century, the late 7th century BCE, sometime between the 640s and the 610s. That is when, um, that is when the, we see in the book of Deuteronomy, we encounter for the first time the term Torah, translated by modern scholars as teaching, more than as law. Uh, making reference to the notion that, at that point, uh, there is a community of people who recognizes a particular book of teaching as being divine, as being the word of God, and as expressing uh, the covenant. Again, a special relationship, a special pact, if you will, between the people of Israel and the God of Israel. Um, that is what we start, what most scholars call the beginning of biblical religion, or more particularly of one trend of biblical religion that scholars call the Deuteronomistic Covenantal religion. <laughs> A religion based, centered on this concept of the covenant, uh, again, seeing almost as a, like a legal arrangement between the God of Israel, Yahweh, and the people of Israel, um, and again, that covenant being sanctioned by this sort of divine teaching. And uh, so, a, a text-based, in, in a way, religion. Now, around the same time, another form of Israelite religion um, had also emerged, that shared with this Deuteronomistic trend the belief in one God, monotheism this time, not monolatry, the belief that there is one God and just the, all of the others just are not gods. They're fake. 
their idols. Hmm? And the focus on one temple. Not multiple shrines, not multiple places where you can go and bring your sacrifices, but just one place. Hmm? And that other trend is what scholars call the priestly religion, which instead of focusing on that covenant, on uh, that, uh, again, uh, um, pact between God and people that is um, mainly maintained through obedience to commandments, hmm? um, they see, um, they focus really on the sacrifices and the rituals that one has to practice at the temple. So, at this point in time, sometime between the 7th and the, se and the 6th century BCE, uh, we cannot yet, I think, talk about Judaism just because the term doesn't exist yet. Hmm? But we can talk about a form of religion that is centered in the land of Israel, um, that has one party called Israel and another party called the one God of Israel, and that sees, at least in one form, Torah as the sanctioning of that, uh, of that uh, uh, partnership, and on the other hand, views the, 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 the main core of that partnership in the sacrifices at the temple. So, if you will, a religion that has a blood aspect and a book aspect. Things change quite dramatically during the Babylonian exile in the 6th century. Once the temple of Jerusalem, the first temple of Jerusalem is destroyed and the, at least the elite people living in Judah, the king, the royal family, the scribes, the priests, the temple officials get exiled into Babylonia. Now, at that point, those 60-70 years of exile are a moment where um, what had been until then, the religion of the Israelite people had to be completely rethought and reformulated for a very simple reason. There is no longer a temple, and there is no longer a land um, to, um, to deal with. That is when the book part, the Torah part of Israelite religion really uh, uh, takes center stage. Really takes center stage. It is also the time when we start encountering um, certain concepts that will become central in, re in, um, in Judaism, such as the notion of exile and the notion of, um, of the messianic return to the land, to, the Zion, to Zion and to the, um, the temple. It is also the time, as I said, where because of the inability to get access to the temple and to perform sacrifices, the study of the text, the study of Torah, becomes the central form of worship, if you will. Um, in the late 60th, 6th century BCE, as you probably know, um, once Cyrus, the king of Persia, conquers the Babylonian Empire, um, Judeans, or the Israelite exiles to Babylon, are then allowed to return to their land and to rebuild the temple. This is the beginning of what scholars call the Second Temple Period that uh, lasts for about uh, six centuries, until 70 CE, when the Romans destroy the Second Temple and they basically destroy it for good because we don't have a Third Temple. Um, this is the time during the Persian and then the, um, the, the, the Greek conquest of Palestine and neighboring areas under Alexander the Great, this is the time when the word Judaism first begins to emerge. In fact, the term Judaism to refer to uh, a, a religion or a group of people who practice a certain uh, form of religion that is unique and distinctive emerges 
not in Hebrew, but in Greek. It, uh, it is first attested in a number of texts from um, the second century, typically BCE, uh, when Jews, or people who are called Jews by other people, uh, are heavily persecuted while in uh, Palestine by the uh, ruling Greek Empire. Uh, so that's when we can start really talking about Judaism just because the word emerges. Uh, the Second Temple period is also the period where we see the emergence of multiple forms of Judaism. So if I have to say something in general, if, I, if, if there is anything that I would like you to get uh, to walk away with tonight, it's really the notion that we cannot talk historically speaking, about Judaism in the singular, but we should really recognize that uh, uh, Judaism has always been a kind of a, 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 um, a plural phenomenon. And uh, one of the most obvious examples of that historical fact is the fact that during the, um, the Second Temple period, when Jews were under Greek and then under Roman um, control, uh, we have the famous <coughs> groups, different groups of, uh, of Jews that we hear about, for example, in the New Testament, but also in the writings of Philo, in the writings of, uh, of, uh, of Josephus, and so on and so forth. Right? We hear about the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, and the Essenes, and the Zealots. Well, guess what? They were all Jews but they practiced different forms of Judaism, right? So the Sadducees, for example, were uh, in very good terms, generally speaking, with the ruling Greek or Roman um, sovereigns. Uh, they were attached to the Temple of Jerusalem. They had high positions there, and uh, they were for example, distinguished for being literalists in their interpretation of scripture, of Torah, and also by not believing in the immortality of the soul, not believing in resurrection. By contrast, Pharisees were uh, less uh, prone to a literal interpretation of Torah, and more, um, if you will, more uh, inclined towards a certain loose interpretation of the spirit of the text. Uh, they also believed in the immortality of the soul, and uh, they came from a different social class than the Sadducees, be more like artisans and kind of uh, what we would call middle class perhaps today. <laughs> then there were the Essenes, one of the few groups in Jewish history of really ascetic, um, ascetic uh, uh, um, uh, Jews who chose to leave Jerusalem and the temple to build a community, uh, almost like a monastic community, uh, in the caves, around the caves on the Dead Sea. Uh, some scholars, most scholars perhaps, believe that it was the Essenes who left us the so-called Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, why did they leave? Well, they were not happy with the Sadducees, they were not happy with the Greco-Roman rulers, and they were also not happy with the Jews who, were, who in Jerusalem were too much uh, familiar or too much friendly to, with, with the Romans. Uh, they came to identify the high priest of the Temple of Jerusalem as essentially a sort of a metaphysical evil force um, that they contrasted with their own high priest, the own, their, their own, the own leader of their own community, uh, who was considered to be the priest of light as opposed to the priest of the master of light as opposed to the master of darkness. And then there were the zealots, another group of Jews, uh, who were so strongly anti-Roman to commit what we call today suicide attacks against the Romans and who may have been responsible, for example, for the episode uh, that came down in history 
as the massacre in Masada, this Roman fortress, and that sea on where, uh, rather than surrendering to the Roman army, a group of Jews decided <coughs> to kill each other and then to commit suicide. Okay? So as you can see, these are different forms of Judaism, both in terms of how they related to the <coughs> dominant power, the ruling power, but also in the ways in which they, uh, their beliefs were, and to some extent, in the ways in which they conceived of Torah. While by and large, by this point in history, the term Torah, or the content of that covenant, indicates what we have today, what we call today the Hebrew Bible, or Tanakh, the entire 24 books, not just the Pentateuch, but also the historical books, the prophetic books, and what is called the uh, uh, the Ketuvim, the writings, so the scrolls and, and books uh, uh, such as uh, Proverbs, Wisdom Literature and the Psalms, etc., etc., um, not all of the groups agreed upon which of those 24 books actually were holy, actually were to be included in the canon. For example, the Essenes, or the community that we have found the remains of in Qumran, refused to include the scroll of Esther in their Bible. Why? Well, you know, after all, Esther is famously the one book in the Bible where there is no mention of God. Now, geographically speaking, here, uh, we are now beginning to look, especially after the destruction of the Second Temple uh, and the exile of the second and massive exile of Jews all over the world, we're now looking at multiple centers for Judaism. Not, no longer just Palestine, um, no longer just the rest of the Mediterranean, but also places like, of course, what uh, was then uh, uh, Persia, and is today Iraq and Iran. Um, so that the main centers at the closing of what scholars called the Second Temple period, again, the first century CE, are essentially two. There's two main centers for Judaism. One is in the land of Israel, in Palestine, and the other one is in the east, in uh, the Middle East, the border between Middle East and Central Asia, um, again, in what would be today Iraq. Out of those two centers come the main documents and the main forms of Judaism that we see in the following period. Now, scholars tend to call the following period in Jewish history the Rabbinic period, beginning with the end of the first century CE and ending more or less with the uh, rise of Islam in the early 7th century. Now, this is a time when Judaism emerges, develops and emerges in the way that we have basically seen it all the way into the mid-19th century. This is the period of the formation of Rabbinic Judaism. A group of Jews, likely successors of the Pharisees, starts calling themselves rabbis. And uh, they emerge both in the, in the Palestinian center and in the Babylonian center. And they start uh, developing literature. Literature of interpretation to the Torah, literature of interpretation to the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, if you wish. Um, <coughs> what is it that characterizes that literature? Um, essentially, again, this is a moment when, um, when 
Judaism has to adapt to the fact that maybe there will never be another temple. And so what was once a religion that could be based both on blood or sacrifices and temple and on text now takes just one focus, the direction of text. Um, circumstances have changed. And because of that, um, what were the laws and the rituals and the customs that one could find and adapt and adopt in the Bible need to be rethought, need to be reconsidered and adapted again to historical circumstances that are very different. Uh, so on the one hand, rabbis try to uh, preserve as much as possible of uh, um, all of those laws and all of those traditions. On the other hand, on the other hand, they develop um, a number of works that then became canonic. Uh, the earliest work is called the Mishnah, which is a early third century um, a legal treaty that tries to extract rules and laws to live by in a time when um, Jews have no longer access to the land of Israel and they have no longer access to the temple simply because the temple is no longer standing. Um, the laws and the rules in the Mishnah are then further collected and developed out of discussion um, and take uh, um, their, their, their later development, uh, which occurs between the 5th and the 6th century CE, uh, takes the form of the two Talmudim, a Talmud uh, put together by the Palestinian community and a Talmud put together by the Babylonian community, which eventually supersedes the Jerusalem one, the Palestinian one, and becomes canonical for all Jews all over the world, and which is still considered to be uh, likely the most important work for at least Orthodox Jews today. Now, at this point again, um, what is Judaism? Well, again, a temple-less religion that is based on study, is based on a worship that cannot happen at a centralized temple, but must by force happen at uh, multiple study houses and synagogues, gathering places, um, and where the way in which one can access God, can gain access to God, is essentially through the text. There's a famous Talmudic saying that says, turn it, turn it, because everything is in it. And a turn it, turn it, the it is a reference to Torah. So what the rabbis are doing is to read and reread and very creatively reinterpret whatever is written in the Hebrew Bible and extract from that all sorts of rules, all sorts of customs, but also all sorts of stories and folklore and mythologies that they can live by and that they can think with. Um, they also come up with this really interesting concept, which is to say, what the rabbis say about their work is that uh, while the Bible is the so-called written Torah, their work is nothing but oral Torah, claiming that their own interpretation, their own laws, their own set of rules and customs were in fact originally revealed to Moses at Sinai and were passed down orally generation after generation. They come up, this is a passage in the Mishnah, their earliest written work, 
that says, that puts together this notion of the chain of tradition. Moses received the law from God on Sinai, passed it down to the elders, the elders to the community, blah, 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 all the way down to Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, who was the compiler of the Mishnah. The claim is that the rabbis were not inventing anything new. They were just merely putting down in writing something that has been the word of God since forever, since the original revelation. What you see then is that by the beginning of the Middle Ages, Torah, right, that content of the revelation, that content of that covenant, of that spatial relationship between the people of Israel and their God, has uh, become something much bigger than just the Hebrew Bible, than just the Old Testament. Because it now includes also oral Torah. That is to say, all of the rabbinic writings, the Mishnah and the Talmud and the Midrash, basically all of their interpretations are now, at least in theory, they're now, the rabbis are claiming that they are on equal par, on the same standing with the written Torah. Now, in the Middle Ages, um, all things happen. <laughs> but um, we can divide the Middle Ages when it comes to Judaism into two distinct areas. There are Jews under Islamic rule, they are by far the majority until the late 13th century, and then there are Jews under Christian rule, especially in Europe, um, and they become the most prominent community uh, beginning in the 13th century, more or less, when really Christians start regaining ground over Muslim countries, especially in Europe, with the so-called Reconquista, which, uh, which is concluded in the late 15th century in Spain. This is the time when uh, Judaism gets, uh, when, when Rabbinic Judaism, right, the Judaism that sees uh, that, that has this idea of the, of the oral Torah that eventually gets written down, uh, gains grounds and becomes mainstream. There is only one group that challenges that form of Judaism, and it's another form of Judaism called Karaism. Uh, a group of Jews called the Karaites, who refuse to recognize the authoritativeness of rabbinic literature. They just say, no, what you call oral Torah, right? This whole story about the chain of tradition, the fact that the stuff was revealed by Moses, we don't buy into it, okay? We'll stick with a literal interpretation of scripture. And for about a couple of hundred years, Karaites are up to 40% of the Jewish population. Now, they are historically on the losing end of things, and that's why we don't hear about them terribly often. It is also very hard to live by the letter of the Bible, as, uh, as some of us know, at least from reality shows. Uh, not being able to, you know, switch on a light for 24 hours or to leave your house doesn't make for a very easy life and uh, although you have to know that uh, small pockets of carrots still exist, they have a synagogue for example in the old city of Jerusalem and, and there's still some. Uh, they survive by eventually creating their own interp interpretive tradition, okay? Uh, they didn't remain, you know, pure biblicist for their entire history. Uh, but other than that challenge from the Karaites that lasted for again about uh, up until maybe the 10th century CE, um, Rabbinic Judaism developed essentially um, unchallenged and really became mainstream Judaism. Uh, what does develop, however, in the Middle Ages is a form or forms of philosophical Judaism on the one hand and forms of mystical Judaism, or Kabbalah, on the other hand. So, 
especially in places like Spain and in general under in all areas where Islam was ruling uh, beginning from perhaps the 9th century um, Jewish authors become to be exposed to the classics of Greek, of Greek philosophy Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics and so on and so forth all of those um, works that uh, seem to have been lost for a few centuries are now available again thanks to translations from the Arabic or from the Syriac that oftentimes Jews themselves as multilingual agents carry out. Um, what that does is <coughs> it prompts a reinterpretation of Judaism according to uh, whichever philosophy is the most popular at the time. So, for the most famous example is that of Maimonides, who writes The Guide of the Perplexed in the late uh, 12th century. Maimonides died in 1204. And uh, where he basically again reinterprets Torah to make it coincide with Aristotelian physics and metaphysics. And he reinterprets again the biblical God in terms of the Aristotelian uh, 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 cause of causes and uh, uh, unmovable mover. To some extent, a reaction to this philosophical and hyper, if you will, theoretical and abstract conception of Judaism takes place once uh, Spain, in particular, moves from the rule of Islam to the rules of Christianity. And that is when, beginning in the late 13th century, mid 13th century, we start seeing the first Kabbalistic works. Now, Jews, especially in Provence and in Catalonia, in southern France and northern Spain, um, start developing a new non-philosophical, but uh, to some extent mythological and symbolic interpretation to the Bible. They start reading the Bible not as a story of real people, but as a story that reflects on Earth what is really happening in the interior life of God on a different plane, on a celestial plane. Biblical characters are reinterpreted as being attributes of God, so that, for example, Isaac represents the sternness, the might of God, where, um, for example, uh, Jacob represents the kindness, the mercifulness aspect of God. And so, every time, in a Kabbalistic reading of the Bible, every time one of those characters is mentioned, right, the reader really sees what is unfolding in the divine realm. Famously, the most, uh, the most uh, central concept in Kabbalah, in a Kabbalistic interpretation of Torah, is the notion that the divine word is made up of ten sfirot, of ten entities, ten attributes of God that represents, uh, that may represent, may be seen anthropomorphically as parts of God's body, but may generally be seen as again, especially, um, especially as uh, his two main attributes of of mercifulness on the one hand and of might and power on the other hand um, and uh, the since there is a parallelism between the word and the life of God so to speak up there and the word our word and our lives here and they mirror each other our task as human beings becomes that of uh, uh, creating a harmony achieving a harmony in the divine word, a balance between 
sternness and mercifulness, a balance between love and power, if you will, through our performance of commandments, through our ethics, and uh, through our faithfulness to Judaism. Again, to some extent, this is a conservative reaction to a philosophical interpretation of Judaism that Maimonides had spearheaded. So, interesting, interestingly, what we see in the Middle Ages is yet another uh, enlargement, if you will, of what counts as Torah. By the end of the Middle Ages, Torah is no longer just written Torah, the Bible, or Old Testament, again, plus oral Torah, all of rabbinic literature, the Mishnah and the Talmud, etc., etc., but it becomes also Maimonides' philosophy, that is also Torah, and the works of the Kabbalah, mainly the Zohar, which is the um, commentary, the, the, the symbolic and Kabbalistic interpretation of the Pentateuch and some other biblical books. What counts as divine revelation, in other words, uh, becomes more and more and more literature. The end of this period is marked by two main events. One is 1492, which is the expulsion of all non-Christians from Spain and Portugal. That's the culmination of the Reconquista and the achievement of a Christian Europe, or at least a Christian Iberian Peninsula under Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, what that triggers is a mass movement of Jews who had lived in Spain and Portugal for close to uh, 700 years by this time, and who are forced to either convert or to leave. On the one hand, this is the beginning of a new form of Judaism, if you will, what we call the Marano phenomenon. People who act publicly, behave publicly as Christians, but keep Jewish rituals and Jewish practices in the clothes of their homes. On the other hand, what happens is that uh, 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 right about 20 years after the expulsion, this mass expulsions of Jews from Spain, uh, not only the Protestant Reformation happens, but uh, the Ottoman Empire takes over Palestine. What that means is that Jews who had been forced to leave Spain can now return after almost 1500 years to Palestine and leave there. So, with the beginning of what we call the early modern period, um, to some extent, there is a much wider dispersion of Jews all over the world. This is also the period when we start seeing um, the first Jews arriving on this side of the Atlantic in America. The first Jews famously arrived in America in 1654, the first group. But it is also, again, the moment when we start having quite separate and distinctive Jewish community. For example, the most famous division is between the Ashkenazi community and the Sephardi community. Sephardi Jews, uh, Sephard means meaning Spain, are the Jews who are the, uh, the, the exiles or the descendants of the exiles from Spain and Portugal, who settle in this place as different as uh, the Netherlands, and uh, uh, to some extent Italy, certain pockets of Italy, and Northern Africa, and Palestine, and all the rest of the Ottoman Empire. Now, on the other hand, we have the Ashkenazi community, Ashkenaz meaning Germany, uh, which, uh, which uh, includes um, all Jews living uh, from Germany to Poland and Lithuania, all sorts of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. 
uh, these communities are quite different. Uh, they, to some extent, represent different forms of Judaism, once again. Ashkenazi Jews speak Yiddish, uh, which is a combination, can be a combination of, uh, of uh, German and Hebrew, or really a combination of Polish and Hebrew. But uh, Sephardim speak Ladino, which is basically a combination of Spanish and Portuguese and Hebrew. And then, of course, there's uh, uh, some, um, again, especially what we call the Western Sephardi Jews, who end up in places like England and Netherlands and here in the Americas and uh, 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 in places like New Amsterdam and in Brazil. Um, they uh, are much more, um, have much more closer ties to Spanish and Portuguese culture uh, to the point of seeing an example such as that of Spinoza, who in the 17th century is a Jew from Amsterdam who believes, uh, who recognizes as Torah, not just uh, the Old Testament but also the New Testament. That is the extent of, uh, of, uh, of, of Christianization, if you will, or, or familiarity with Christian culture that certain Sephardi Jews at that point have. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them, again Spinoza, reject, for example, the Talmud as being Torah. So yes to the New Testament, but no to the Talmud. That's a quite interesting way of putting things. And then, of course, this is the time of the ghettos. Um, not because I am Italian, but uh, Italian Jews are always a little different. <laughs> Neither Ashkenazi nor Sephardi. Um, Italy has, in fact, uh, one of the oldest Jewish communities in the diaspora. The first Jews arrived in Italy even before the destruction of the temple. We think around the second century, mid-second century BCE. Uh, but at this time, Northern Italy is especially interesting because you have a place like Venice where you have Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardi Jews and Italian Jews who had already been there. And so you have really a melting pot of the different forms of Judas, the different Jewish groups, Jewish identities that all coalesce in this little island that in 1516 decides to... Uh, give Jews not just a particular neighborhood, but also to lock that neighborhood up at night so that Jews can live there and only there. Uh, but in that tiny neighborhood that is the ghetto, there are five synagogues. If you go to Venice, to the Jewish neighborhood in Venice, today, well, the ghetto is not the Jewish neighborhood, you can still visit them. They're all about, uh, they're all about as big as the room where we are now, but there is one for the Italians, and one for the Sephardim, and one for the Ashkenazim, and then there's a couple more for some other interesting groups. Um, if there is a lot of dispersion, if you will, a lot of uh, variation in this period, geographically speaking, on the other hand, we see a certain tendency to a uniformity of Judaism, a tendency toward a standardization of Judaism. And that is the result of one big event, which is the invention of the printing press. At this point, customs that uh, different Jews in different parts of the world had developed independently uh, get standardized the moment that two things happen. First of all, um, manuals of liturgy, prayer books, are first printed out and uh, passed around and distributed so that everyone begins to pray more or less in the same way. The second thing that happens connected to the printing press is that uh, uh, legal codes, mm, uh, manuals that tell a Jew what he or she should do at any given time of the day become extremely popular. Notice, we've talked about rabbinic literature, we talk about the Talmud and the Mishnah being legal works, 
but they are not the kind of legal works that make it easy for you to know what you have to do, because the format of the Talmud is one of a discussion. Rabbi X says that you should light the candle when you see a certain amount, a certain number of stars on Friday night. But Rabbi Y says, well, actually, if it's raining, you should do something else. And then there's Rabbi Z with a third opinion. That is the nature of the Talmud. It's a discussion about what the law should be, oftentimes without arriving at a clear resolution. It's a fascinating work of dialectics. It's terribly impractical. <laughs> so, already in the Middle Ages, codes, uh, sometimes summarizing the debates in the Talmud and then giving you uh, the point of arrival, a point of solution, sometimes just skipping over all of the discussion and just telling you, hey, this is a time when you have to light the candles. Hmm? Uh, as I was saying, although these um, legal um, these uh, legal codes had already um, originated in the Middle Ages, for example, one of the most famous ones was authored by Maimonides, the same philosopher that we talked about, uh, they become popular and authoritative only in the 16th century because, in part, of the printing press. Because people can print them out and disseminate them in a rather uh, economical way all over the place. The other important development is the development of uh, the spreading through the printing press of Kabbalah. And Kabbalistic works <coughs> originating mainly from Palestine, where now a number of Jews have been able to return and to gather. The spread of these ideas, the, spread of, the spreading of the works, thanks to the printing press, um, makes for um, a, a, um, a rise in popularity of this interpretation of Judaism, if you will, across Europe. And uh, uh, also, uh, in part because of, the, um, of, of a way of seeing that expulsion from Spain as a second exile, as a second exile, uh, that gives rise to a certain heightened messianic tension whereby a lot of Jews all over Europe start buying into the idea that this is, we are nearing the time of the end and the Messiah will soon come. The Messiah, in fact, shows up in multiple incarnations. The most famous or infamous one being Shabbatai Tzvi. A Jew from Smyrna, in today's Turkey, who in the early 1660s declares that he is, in fact, the Messiah. He's not the first to make that claim, but for a number of circumstances that uh, we don't need to discuss here, he's actually believed by a lot of Jews, all over the world, until he does the unthinkable. In 1666, Shabbat Tzvi, pressed by the Sultan, converts to Islam. <laughs> he takes the turban. Um, some of his followers, uh, a lot of European and non-European Judaism is now thrown into distress, although some of his followers think that that is just sort of a tactical move, uh, which can be interpreted Kabbalistically, as the last, uh, uh, the last key to unfold the messianic era, but that's kind of a minority opinion. It is at the end of this period, however, in part precisely because of this messianic challenge to mainstream Judaism, that we start seeing the first real alternatives to a rabbinic Judaism that has basically dominated the scene of Judaism for the previous maybe 1500 years. In late 18th century, we see 
two contrasting phenomena. On the one hand, the rise of, the rise of Hasidism, a form of Judaism uh, originating in Eastern Europe that uh, uh, downplays, at least initially, the importance of Torah study as the main form of worship, really as the main form of encountering God in the text, and emphasizes mystical prayer, emphasizing, emphasizes enthusiasm, emphasizing the fact that with our own um, daily activities, done with the proper intention, we can achieve a form of communion or union with God, a true experience of the divine. Okay, sorry. Charismatic leaders emerge, who are then followed by uh, a number of uh, people who, um, a number of other Jews who go into pilgrimage, not to study with these leaders, with the Rebbe, but uh, as one famous Hasid put it, to see how they tie up their laces. Um, there's another challenge on the opposite spectrum, if, side of the spectrum, if you will, to the traditional communal system of authority, and that is called Haskalah, or Jewish Enlightenment. Especially in Germany, where the Enlightenment, with the likes of Mendelssohn and Kant, has, uh, has been unfolding, uh, a number of very well-educated Jews start advocating for the study of science, philosophy, grammar, philology as uh, necessary companions to the study of the Talmud, the study of, the, of, of Jewish law, and so on and so forth, and who also seek integration into the modern nation, political, economic, social integration into the, uh, the uh, uh, raising uh, modern states. This is where we begin to see the different forms of Judaism as we know them today. It is, to some extent, as a heir to the Jewish Enlightenment, to the Haskalah in the 17th century, that in Germany, at the, in the second quarter of the 19th century, we see the origin of Reform Judaism. Uh, a form of Judaism that advocates for, um, advocates for uh, prayer in the vernacular instead of in Hebrew, uh, advocates for the use of music in services, advocates for... Uh, a form of Judaism that is centered on ethical monotheism, much more universalistic, uh, that downplays the importance of rituals, the importance of the performance of commandments, particularly those commandments that separate Jews from the rest of the other traditions, um, and that to some extent also downplays the importance of the um, special connection with the uh, land of Israel. As a response to this, to reform Judaism, we see, as a reaction to it, we also see the emergence of what we call today orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is not an ancient phenomenon. It's a response to modernity. Is a response, in a sense, to reform in the same way that we can say certain fundamentalist groups of Islam are a response to modernizing trends in Islam. Um, Orthodox Judaism, also emerging in Germany in the 19th century, uh, emphasizing the crucial importance of commandments, no matter how rational or irrational they may seem. Uh, the uh, focus on the eternal revelation of God once and for all at Sinai and so on and so forth. Um, 
a sort of a middle of the road view of Judaism also emerges in Germany at this time. It is what is called positive historical Judaism, which uh, tries to take uh, the best of both worlds, if you will. Both a commitment to Jewish law and tradition and a certain sense of historical development. Those three main forms of Judaism emerging in Germany in the 19th century essentially move to America. And they give us what we see today. So, to move from the general, um, perhaps, uh, um, perhaps the general to the more particular, um, the first Jews we see in Springfield hmm, came here as merchants shortly after the foundation of the city in 1838 and they were part of the first wave, or rather I should say the second wave of Jews that came to America. They were German Reformed Jews arriving here in the second half or around, uh, around mid-19th century. Um, I said the second wave because again the first groups of Jews were Sephardi Jews who came here in the in you know in 1654 and really in the mid 17th century. But then for about you know 200 years uh, there were no new waves of massive at least significant waves of Jews that came to America. Um, now that initial that initial. Um, group of Jews that came to Springfield and to the Ozark founded its first congregation in 1893 again a reform, German reform congregation. Uh, those Jews were joined in 1918 right after World War I by a group of Orthodox Jews coming not from Germany but from Eastern Europe. So you see how uh, again, those two uh, forms of Judaism, Reform and Orthodox, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, developed in Germany in, um, in the uh, 19th century, uh, eventually both made it to America, and they are, they are still today, uh, I would say, the two main, the two larger, the two larger, larger denominations, Jewish denominations in the United States. Um, when it comes to Springfield and the Ozark in particular, um, two communities, one Orthodox and one Reform, were not sustainable. And in fact, uh, uh, in the 1940s there was a merger of the two communities into what is now Temple Israel, the only uh, synagogue that we have out in Rogersville, it used to be in downtown Springfield, well not downtown, in the Round Tree neighborhood uh, for many many years until about 25 years ago and uh, today uh, there is a um, community made of, I'm not sure how many families, uh, maybe 30 to 50 families, I'm not sure, uh, that is nominally a reform congregation but where there's still other uh, uh, Jews who do not necessarily consider themselves reform who attend services because in part that is the only option. Um, generally speaking, the state of uh, forms of different forms of Judaism or Jewish denominations that we see in America today includes not just again reform and orthodox but uh, a variety of other groups uh, somewhere in between. On the one hand is conservative Judaism, a hair to what uh, in Germany was called the positive historical Judaism, um, but then also within orthodoxy there is a certain amount of variation. On the one hand we have the so-called modern orthodox Jews who while uh, maintaining all of the, all of the, um, all of the commandments also advocate and embrace the study of secular sciences. On the other side, 
in the orthodox world, there is the phenomenon of what is called uh, uh, ultra-orthodoxy by scholars or what uh, uh, the groups themselves call themselves is Haredim or Haredi Judaism, meaning Haredi meaning devout, devout or pious, who essentially reject modernity, reject modern technology. Uh, the most visible form of those groups today in America is Chabad, uh, which has, uh, uh, which does a lot of outreach on college campuses, although we don't have uh, a Chabad chapter here at Missouri State. Uh, there are in uh, all over the United States. Um, and uh, who, generally speaking, again, are, um, um, are in a sense, anti-modern. Mm? Uh, there is a certain irony into that, because on the one hand, uh, they are very anti-modern, on the other hand, uh, they have a huge, a massive presence on the web. <laughs> um, and they use that as a tool of outreach in very savvy ways. Um, on the opposite side of the spectrum in America, we see, um, we see groups such as uh, uh, so-called Reconstructionist Judaism, which is a completely American phenomenon. It was invented out of conservative Judaism by Mordechai Kaplan in the early 20th century, um, and it is a form of Judaism that has no presence outside of the United States, very heavily influenced by uh, American pragmatism, uh, and, and, and American philosophers such as Pierce and Dewey, and so on and so forth. Um, and then also certain forms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, New Age Judaism, such as Jewish Renewal, uh, which has, uh, uh, you know, which, which is part of the um, new religious developments in the 1960s and the 1970s, and it has a large presence in places like Boulder, Colorado, or in California, all the places that you associate with uh, these kind of countercultural uh, phenomena. Uh, the situation is similar in Israel, but that is not uh, what uh, we should be particularly interested in. Now, if I am allowed, I would like to say just a couple of words about Thomas Moore Johnson and Judaism. Uh, since Tom Johnson kindly provided me with a sample of books from his wonderful library. Um, Those are the only ones I could locate uh, <coughs> in a brief search that uh, seemed to involve Judaism. Right. <clears throat> um, from my own readings and study of Thomas Moore Johnson's work, um, I can say that Thomas Moore Johnson was interested in one particular form of Judaism, of the many that we have uh, sketched out today, and that is Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism. In his library, as can be seen here, there are a number of works of uh, Kabbalah, or at least of the way in which Kabbalah was received on the American soil in the late 19th century. Uh, famous Kabbalah Unveiled, this is a uh, late, again, 19th century anthology of uh, medieval Kabbalistic works translated, especially the Zohar, the classic work of medieval Kabbalah that we talked about, and also um, here another volume, Kabbalah by Isaac Meyer, also, Meyer was a convert from Judaism to uh, Protestant Christianity, and uh, arguably uh, one of the first quasi-scholar of Kabbalah in the late 19th century. Isaac Meyer had actually a correspondence, a written correspondence, with Thomas Moore Johnson. We were able to dig up a couple of letters recently, and uh, uh, part of his work on Kabbalah includes translations of the Zohar, uh, the medieval, again, uh, Kabbalistic Bible, so to speak, but also of the philosophy of Ibn Gvirol, who was a, um, a Spanish Neoplatonic uh, 
uh, uh, uh, um, Jewish poet. Uh, additionally, uh, Johnson had, um, had been able to recover translation, German and English translations, of uh, another early Kabbalistic work, which is called the Sefer Yetzirah, or the Book of Formation, another very popular classic work, uh, and some other interesting works, as I said, uh, I happen to know this, this is the Sefer Shemush HaTehilim, uh, a book for the usage, you could say the magical usage of Psalms, uh, that, uh, uh, that was translated from the Hebrew to the German in 1849, and it is subtitled as a book of practical Kabbalah, meaning, again, essentially a form of magic. Uh, essentially a form of magic. And the author of this uh, book, if I remember correctly, Gottfried Selig, was actually Jewish. Uh, one other interesting aspect of uh, Thomas Moore Johnson's um, relationship with Judaism was the fact that in the journal that he edited in the 1880s, The Platonist, um, if I remember correctly, in particularly in the year 1888, he published two articles by a reform rabbi who had come from Germany to the United States and who had uh, uh, held rabbinic posts in uh, a lot of different places in America by the name of Emanuel Schreiber. Now, Emanuel Schreiber st uh, studied in Germany at the Reform Seminary. He was uh, a student of, uh, of uh, Geiger, who was one of the forefathers, founding fathers of Reform Judaism. And uh, Schreiber was interested in something that was very uncommon as an interest for Reform Judaism in the 19th century. He was interested in Spinoza, and one of the articles that he published for the Platonists was on Spinoza and on how uh, the doctrines of Spinoza were in fact perfectly compatible with mainstream Judaism, which uh, after what I've said about Spinoza you could, uh, uh, you could have some doubts about. Um, and he also published another article authored by Rabbi Schreiber on the Gnostics. Now this is 1888. Okay, the Nag Hammadi documents, the, 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 all of the primary sources, or original sources of Gnosticism had yet to be discovered. And yet there is somebody who is, in theory, a champion of, you know, the most universalistic and rationalistic forms of Judaism, who has an interest in all of these esoteric and secret and really abstruse um, uh, uh, interpretations of Judaism. And Schreiber argued that the Gnostics were, in fact, uh, 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 um, a, a, the Gnostic phenomenon was, in fact, uh, a sort of a, of a development of uh, certain forms, certain early forms of Judaism. And then, of course, the Gnostics, so, so even if the Gnostics then turned out to be, um, to some extent, radically anti-Jewish by identifying the a secondary evil god with the god of, of the Hebrew Bible, um, they themselves, at least some of the authors, were originally uh, uh, Jewish converts. Okay. Um, this is probably what I want to close with, just having a small note on uh, Thomas Moore Johnson and Judaism, since we are in his house and in his library. And uh, I will be very happy to answer any question you may have, and I know that uh, you won't deserve that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question will. for you. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, why do you think that in the New Testament there is no mention of the Essenes. Is scribe a, a, a <coughs> different word for them or? Right. Well, you know, it's um, it's the um, the New Testament is not the only place uh, where there's no mentions of the Essenes, right? The 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 Essenes are in fact mentioned uh, most extensively in Philo's work and Josephus also talks about them. Uh, 
but but uh, you know they're this group that's you know they're, they're kind of a tiny group and they're kind of out in the desert, right? And they've got they do their own thing. They've got their own scriptures. They've got their own form of Judaism. They don't. They hate the Temple of Jerusalem. They hate basically all of the other Jews who think that they are you know just compromising with with the pagans with the weak pagans, and so. I'm not terribly surprised that, that, that they're not mentioned in sources like the New Testament, which are much closer, if you will, to the kind of that Greco-Roman uh, uh, environment and who are much more tied to, you know, places like Jerusalem and the Galilee and, and places like that. Mm -hmm. um, there may be also, there may also be issues of time. So the Essenes were basically wiped out by the Romans, by the end of the first century CE, and we know that the earliest layers of some of the New Testament were, you know, about the middle of the second century, right? Later than that. So, Maybe after the Roman destruction. Right, yes, no, definitely, definitely after the Roman destruction. Right. Definitely after. So, so if you if you you know if you believe with most scholars that the earliest layers of the New Testament were not written until about 150 CE or something like that, you already have about 80 years, right? It means that they were written about 80 years after the Essenes had been wiped out. Oh, okay, gotcha. Already. So that may be one of the things. Yeah, yes. Could you say something about Masonic Judaism? Masonic Judaism? I know nothing about it. <laughs> okay, well, Masonic Judaism, it was started in the late uh, 1800s in Russia. Oh, okay. Okay. And then uh, eventually it moved over the United States. Yeah, I think, I think I know what you're talking about then. Um, so, so, you know, part of what we're seeing in the 19th century mm, is um, this spread of interest for forms of Jewish esotericism or Kabbalah that filters into uh, especially Christ Christian groups and then um, and then and then becomes kind of adopted and adopted into all sorts of esoteric groups so there's the Rosicrucians and there's the Freemasons and there's you know the Theosophical Society uh, uh, all of those now um, they are, these are groups that again are typically interested in Judaism only to the extent that they are interested in Jewish mysticism, in Kabbalah, or in the notion that there was some sort of secret tradition within <clears throat> Judaism that has some sort of universal value and that in fact undergirds a lot of existing religion. And um, that was, by the way, at least for a time, that was part of what Thomas More Johnson was interested in. Yes. Um, not Judas per se, but this kind of idea that, 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 uh, that uh, um, there's some common ancient tradition that has been kept secret and only known by select individuals or select groups for many, many centuries um, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that can be revealed or, or should be revealed now and it is the key to the advancement of the spiritual development of humanity and now, you know, in the 19th century uh, it is kind of time to pick that up and to use that to um, again, to further the development of of civilization. I don't know that that answers your questions fully, but that's, I'm afraid, the best I can do. Yes? In the Unitarian Church we have what we call an elevator speech. Mm -hmm. It's when you try to explain your religion going up to the 10th floor. Yes, yes, yes. Do you have an elevator speech for Judaism? I do not. <laughs> yeah, well, I do we not just heard, have we just a speech for Judaism <laughs> because what I was trying to explain tonight is that to do an elevator speech for Judaism as 
to do an elevator speech for Christianity or for Islam or for any number of religious tradition would be to completely deny the historical fact that all of these traditions have changed a lot throughout history and have been even sometimes right at the same time have taken forms that were very different from one another right I mean I have students who don't believe that Catholics are Christians right and Catholicism and Protestant Christianity exist side to side and have existed side to side, uh, sometimes in the same country for a lot of uh, a lot of a number of centuries now. And yet, there's enough people who believe that they're not the same thing. So right, right, if that is true for the Christian tradition, right, the idea that there's forms of Christianity that are so perceived so different from one another that some people don't think that the other are Christians. Well, I think you can make the same case. I was trying to make, at least to I some extent, the, the I same case for Judas. I the floor and I think you do have an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, two things in response to the elevator speech. One is we heard it from Hillel mm -hmm. at the beginning. And, right. And another is I'm an Episcopalian, and we have a little witticism that says that Episcopalians and Jewish people are so close together because we're the only two groups that naturally divide into the high and crazy, the low and lazy, and the broad and hazy. Yes. So there's. I didn't want to. I I didn't want to say that on record. But that's the same thing that people say about Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox Jews, right? Orthodox is crazy. Reform is lazy and conservative is hazy. Well, right. so that's what they say about that, that, major that's denominations. Why <laughs> but I, I wasn't ready to say that. Episcopalians <laughs> say that that's the similarity between us and the Jewish people. And there's another. There's another. You know, since we're in, uh, we're, since we're we're just um, at the point of jokes now. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there's another famous joke that says for every two Jews, there's four synagogues, right? There's one where one goes and the other doesn't, another one where, you know, the second goes and the first doesn't, then there's a third synagogue where both go, and then there's a fourth synagogue where neither goes, right? Okay, well, we have uh, dessert is ready now, so let's put the adjourn for that. Tell me, had a question. Thank yeah, you. I was interested in the ge geographic aspects of right. Judaism. So, I mean, multifaceted. So, did you say that the first ghetto, in the sense that we would say, was a Jewish ghetto, was in Venice? Yes. All right. I mean, that's the place where the word was invented. All right. Because ghetto comes from the Venetian dialect ghetto, yeah, ghetto, yeah. which means a cast. Because that was the 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 the. the the island that was designated as the ghetto oh. was a foundry. Yeah. So they were casting iron there. And so they called it, you know, the place where they cast iron. And so that's where the term comes from. Oh, really? It yeah. is also the first real ghetto because there existed Jewish quarters before, but they were not places where Jews were compelled to live and had to return every night, night. and stay overnight. Be locked up. Right, be locked up. There were Jewish quarters all over the place in the Middle Ages, right? Because Jews, like any other group, had to have the, to acquire from whoever was in charge a permit to settle there, there yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but but that was not. But it was like a different legal situation. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. So then the second part of it is you were you were saying over dinner that. Um, congregations, uh, uh, it's not they die out, but they sort of lose critical mass or something, yes. and, and they disperse. Yes. Uh, and that happened in my hometown, too, where there's a Jewish community and, and there is no more. Right. Um, is anybody studying just sort of like the geographic reality of Judaism? Yeah, absolutely. Most people who do American Jewish history do that. Yeah. Because there's a pattern. I mean, Springfield is very typical, right? What happens is you have, you know, you have uh, larger communities in, say, a place like St. Louis, yeah. and then this is the 19th century, okay? 
and then some families send one son out to as a, a training post to a training post for you know business yeah. um, purposes to you know establish a little trading post a little business some other place right they they start uh, working there for a while they start bringing their family blah 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 you have a small community right mm -hmm. and then when that community grows enough they send more people west right that's mm -hmm. that's just just the way in which the migration worked here mm -hmm. um, in the United States and then uh, but then at some point what happens well you know if if uh, if uh, um, if you don't have I guess enough children, enough infrastructure, and stuff like that. Then communities starts uh, communities start dying down. Sometimes because the business is not so good. Sometimes because uh, again you need, to, especially if you want to live an orthodox life. Okay, you have to have, for example, not just a synagogue and a cemetery. Those are easy things. We have a synagogue and a, and a Jewish cemetery in Springfield, but. You don't have, for example, a kosher butcher, mm -hmm. which means that you cannot, you can eat kosher, but you have to buy everything prepared from high V, right? And if you want, and for such a celebration, you want your fresh meat, it would be nice to have that, right? But you have, uh, if you're in Springfield, you have to order it from St. Louis. Um, and then, if you, especially if you live an Orthodox life, right, you need, uh, you're a woman, you need a mikveh. You need a place where you do your ritual bath once a month, or when you know if somebody wants to convert to Judaism, also has to do that. Uh, when you have a newborn, all those things mm -hmm. that doesn't exist in Springfield. Mm -hmm. So part of the idea is that once you have a variety of forms of Judaism, there are some that are, I guess, more adaptable. Like reform and to some extent conservative, and some that are less adaptable and really need a critical mass, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't have that critical mass, well, those people will start leaving, mm -hmm. and that's what happened here, mm -hmm. at least in spring. And then the people who remain, right? The 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 in part because reform is a little more, I guess, loose or more open to non-Jews. There's the issue of intermarriage and there's yeah. the issue of, of raising children Jewish when, you know, everyone else is not. So in a matter of a couple of generations, part of the, that reform community starts dying out. Mm -hmm. So that's more or less the pattern. Yes.